Okay, good, good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, I know you're all working very hard, so let me first uh, congratulate you on your diligence and say that I've seen enough of the different presentations to think that you'll be just fine. Just don't panic or freak out on your work. You know, if there's anybody in your group that has exam syndrome, you know, there some folks, as they approach an exam, they shut down. Okay, so it's not about that, you know, it's, it's a collegial learning community. Uh, you shouldn't be afraid of mistakes, you should just try to do as great a job as you can without being so concerned that you make yourself overly nervous. That's just not, you know, what it's about. Now, <clears throat> what I will say to you is, when you're doing any kind of a presentation like this, the presenters need to command the room, okay? You want to look from side to side, you want to have presence, as you are presenting, you want to make your references, you know, you, you really have to put a little showbiz in it because, you know, it's, you're a presenter, okay? Uh, you also want to make sure that you're aware of how to use your equipment. I think it was Theodore, Teddy, who, uh, oh, you don't like Teddy, huh? Okay, Ted. It was <coughs> Ted who uh, was indicating that you definitely want to be, um, you know, used to the equipment uh, and not using it for the first time, you know, all of those kind of things. Uh, one of the most important things about a presenter is to find someone in the audience that you can connect with. And so as you look at them, you know, you make that connection. And so therefore you're drawing the group in, okay? Um, you're gonna be presenting from up here, so sort of be aware that, that folks are, you know, kind of below you. And if your line of sight is always out there, then you've made no connection. So you have to at your audience. Um, as you make the most important points, do something with the cadence of your conversation and the volume to indicate that it's important. Okay? Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, yeah. You all are going to have multiple people doing the presentation. So you may literally have four presenters. You know, I mean, in one group, maybe five even. All right, so if that's the case, have the order down like a science so that it's seamless from individual to individual. But you kind of also want to make sure that as the next person is up, as you're finishing, if Randall is finishing and he knows that Christine is next, then as he finishes, he looks to her and nods. You know, so that there's no way that the next person doesn't get the fact that it's their time. You know, it's all about just making the team look seamless. Uh, if the last person did a great job, uh, it's a, you know, great thing to say, that was great. Now, you know, I mean, it's, it's your segue. You know what I'm saying? If you think they forgot something and you want to add it, it's like, yes, and I'd like to add to my colleague's comment, you know, because you don't want to say, well, they forgot this, so let me stick it in. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think that's I think that's mostly it. I think that's I think that's mostly it. Whichever one of you'd like to go next. You can go ahead. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do mine in two parts. I, we did have these case study things, and, and I'm gonna use part of my time because I want you all to see some before and afters and get a sense of what can be achieved when you can't necessarily see it. Um, so I'll, if, um, Wayne, if you can, it should be, it'll say case studies and it, there's a, um, uh, International Stress for Stroke Preservation Leadership Course file and then, uh, presentations and then, uh, case studies. Um, so the things on my mind are, um, now you ought to be, everybody from know where the questions are that you're supposed to answer? You know the the thing that was handed out, you know. So I think you should be ha putting together your outline now, and you should be organizing that and, and feeding your, what you're doing now into it to be efficient. Um, and from my um, experience, uh, I think if you show something on the screen, you need to have something important to say about it. So you don't want to show something that doesn't mean anything. If you show something, it needs to be re legible and um, and a bunch of a bunch of information that can't be absorbed in the time that your audience is looking at it, you shouldn't be putting it up there. So you need to pull out what's important about it 
they can all, if somebody wants to go into it further, they can always go to the deeper end of your report or whatever, but um, pick out what's important and put it in an orderly, progressive fashion so you're building your story along the way. And um, I think graphics are good. Uh, metaphors are good, so we're, you know, there's not necessarily a literal graphic. Sometimes a, a graphic that's kind of a metaphor can help reinforce the point. Um, and um, don't worry. I mean, I, I think it's more important to get your message uh, across efficiently and, and thoroughly than worrying about whether you're consuming all the time or certainly you need to stay within your bracket of time, but that's a prioritizing of of information, so um, that, that's what I, so, uh, yeah, uh, see the NCP, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, down, uh, see the leadership course there, NHTP, uh, NT, right, down, 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 no, no, yeah, there you go, the lectures, no, the, that one, that one's, a, yeah, yeah, that one. Okay, and then uh, go up to lectures, the, back, the bottom folder. That's a right, another bottom one there. there. See lectures? There you go. Yep. Okay, and then three, lecture three. Not really a lecture. And then the PowerPoint. There you go. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, yeah, that'd be great if you can put it on. So I just want to show you a few uh, examples. Um, Okay, great. So, um, well, here we go. All right, so this is a building that uh, we were working at the University of Kentucky. And we were working on the president's house and the president said, we've got this ugly building on our campus. And what can you do with it? So we went over and looked at this building and um, Sorry, Wayne, this is not, not, oh, there we go. So this is this is the building. And so we looked at it, and, you know, it is kind of what it is. And then we went around the side, and there was something odd around, about this building around the side, and it was this, it was these four little symmetrical square windows, which were completely out of context with this building. So, again, it was looking at the building and saying, gee, what, you know, what, what, how did, it, what's, important about this building, even though it was a fairly nondescript building. And so we looked at that and said, gee, there's another story here because this is so uh, weird. Um, and so we, we uh, found the drawings, and what we found was that this was the original building. And a previous president had said, this is an ugly building, what can we do about it? So my point is, there was nobody who had delved deep enough into understanding the building and had made a personal judgment about the aesthetics and the uh, importance of it, when in fact it would have been a very important modern little building on the campus and much more contributing to the, to the environment than, than what they came up with. Those were, we did a lot of probes, and um, uh, we found that underneath all of this, that you can see where the drive it had failed, we, we couldn't find any problems with the skin. Everybody had said the skin failed, the skin failed. We never could find any problems with the skin. And so we convinced them to do a mock-up, uh, meaning we did a test panel of the original. So you can see them uh, uncovering the original, and uh, the drive it's still on the right, and all the gunk they put on the building to get that skin up there. Uh, we did the mock-up and let it sit there a year. The owner looked at it and said, gee, we like the one on the left, and, uh, which is the original restored piece. We put it under high-pressure tests and it passed those tests, and uh, we then proceeded with using tax credits to uh, restore the building, and uh, here it is today. Um, my point here is that we've been doing this 10 years. And if we had just gone with the flow, we would have another drive at skin on this building. And this would never have been recaptured. But by one, having clarity about what you want to achieve and having the determination to understand deeply 
what's, what that building is about and how it's constructed and how it performs, once you start to make those uh, determinations, then you can make informed decisions. I was this morning out in Anselia looking at a 10-story building. They're telling us to tear the skin off. We cannot find a thing wrong with the skin of that building. And um, so it takes some clarity and some confidence to, uh, to move forward and be, be comfortable that the building needs to be telling you something before you react to it. So I think it's just an important uh, example of, of not just taking for granted that if you see something that can't be dealt with, there are ways, uh, ways to deal with things. So the third one I wanted to show you if I can get this thing to advance. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, here we go. Okay, the third one is a little building, a little space actually, in a 1953 uh, architecture school at Georgia Tech. It was the original library, architecture library. This is a, an early picture of what the library looked like. It had a chalkboard for pent up on the left. It had bookshelves on the right. Uh, and um, this is what they wanted to do in that space. So this is the space, about 2,500 square feet. They wanted a multi-purpose room for 60. They wanted four private offices. They wanted three open offices. They wanted a copy station, informal meeting space, reception area. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, reception and uh, waiting area and a reception desk, all in that little 2,500 square feet. So when we started, it was all covered up. You could you could not look into this space. They'd put additions on it, and um, and it w and they'd broken it up into small little cubby holes, and they had the digital imaging lab in there, which were people in the dark looking at screens. So it was uh, completely obliterated. However, the character defining features were all there. <coughs> so this is the space today. Uh, it accommodates four offices. It, 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 they, fortunately, we had the uh, bookshelves. We have a room here for 60. Um, and um, actually, this is the same kind of storefront that's on this building. It's got the same kind of sprue pattern. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't the same manufacturer. And one of the keys is, see how the office space has been used to maintain the appreciation for the historic volume. So we put four offices in, but we, using transparent material, we could, it was very important to maintain an appreciation for the whole volume while we, uh, while we uh, accommodated the, the program. No, just another, another shot of it. Uh, again, the point is the, uh, the realizing the potential that you can create when it starts out as a, a space that is hard, almost difficult to uh, understand. Even in uh, the more I go through the building over here, the the office building, the more I see components they in fact left. Found a where the door frame, where the paint history of the interior you know, on the second floor or third floor is still there. My guess is there are more original petitions in there than you can, you know, without going through in a little more careful examination. But with some more effort, I think it, it, it probably will piece together a bit more of the original structure. Uh, but I, I just wanted to show you these as a an example of, of how you, when you move through this process not only how you can you recapture it, but how you can creatively use it that's inspired by the, preser the, the historically important information that's in the building. So it doesn't have to be dumbed down. It can be a vibrant, uh, you know, the faculty love it. This is an architecture school. The faculty love it. The students love it. It's got energy in it, and yet we've been able to keep the character of that building. I think that's the last one. That's another, another shot. So anyway, um, I just wanted to give you a sense of those things visually to um, kind of motivate your mind. And about how it, how it, how it I'm going to give you a few non-specific notes about nothing in particular, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the first non-specific note, um, just sort of taken off from Irving was talking about, uh, about making presentations, right? And I once had someone tell me there are three things to remember about making presentations. The first thing is you want to remember at the very beginning, tell people what's important. So you really want to remember that. Then the second thing you want to remember is tell them what's important again. 
And then how you really want to close is tell them what's important again. And so the point is you want presentations to be focused. Um, each one of the teams have seen different things. They've seen different things about the value proposition. We really want you to discuss and be clear about what your value proposition is because if there is no value proposition, what you're talking about happening will never happen. So you need to be real clear about the value proposition, right? And because we are talking about historic preservation, you really want to talk about how your value proposition is related to the historic preservation of the building. This building is partially about architecture but probably more so about interpreting the story about what happened here. And so you need to think about programmatically how does what you're preparing or proposing interpret that story for people that don't know that story. Um, and I think, you know, we'll get back to the most important thing again, the value proposition. One of the things that when I was listening to people talk about um, what they were proposing, a lot of the things were things that probably had a whole lot of social benefit, right? And so when I think about you know, making investments in a building, I think about two or three different kinds of capital, right? There's always a sort of financial capital that everyone sort of talks about. There's also the human capital right? And there's the environmental capital. Well, that you are preserving the building and not tearing it down and putting it into a landfill starts to address the environmental capital, right? Because you're finding ways to use resources more efficiently. I heard a lot of talk about the human capital. You wanted to do things that were going to be good for everyone in the community and they were going to make every floor an entrepreneurial floor and provide all these great opportunities for everyone that ever walked the planet of the earth. And you were really going to solve every problem that Birmingham has, right, in this, in this building, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and that's nice, because I tried to do that in my projects also for the first five or ten minutes that I'm thinking about them, right? <laughs> uh, and so, but what you really have to get focused on is something real fundamental, right? Who will pay you rent for that building? Right? And how much will that rent be? Comparing it to what the rest of the market is here, because ultimately the owner of that building is going to have to make that decision. And though you guys might not think of yourselves as experts, right, the owner is going to be sitting here listening closely for ideas about what can make this building work. Because the building is in the state it is right now, what does that tell you? Right, they haven't found the answer, right? And so what we're here for is to be a resource, right, for him. What we're here for also is for you to learn the process so you can take this process back to your own practices, your own communities, and repeat it, refine it, and make a big difference. So that's really what this process, this whole thing is about. So that's my short little piece. Right, and um, you know, in your concluding paragraph, I think you want to make sure that you uh, have stated those important items, as was mentioned. Uh, but you also want to talk a little bit about impact. So one of the things I'm going to do uh, this afternoon, um, or actually some of it, I guess, this morning, is I'm going to give you some rules of thumbs in the individual groups as to how you can do impacts. Uh, like I'm going to give you a job creation factor for um, how many hundreds of thousands of development. Uh, I'm going to give you a construction job factor so that you can actually talk about those impacts. Uh, and then one of the things that I will do, uh, you know, let's say the whole project's 19 million like one of your projects was yesterday. Well, I start by saying this is going to be a $19 million infusion into the gross county, gross city product for this area because you're, that's $19 million of spending that's going to happen because of your project. 
uh, and then you can even go further uh, when you do the job creation numbers, you can look at uh, what the average wages will be and you can look at uh, what the federal income taxes off those jobs will be. You can look at what the state income taxes off those jobs will be. Uh, you can even go down to sales tax and property tax and all that, which you know, I don't think you need to do. But I want you to be aware of that when you are chasing new markets and when you are chasing historic tax credits, people don't want the impact to be just be the project's $19 million and we're putting that infusion in the economy. Mm -hmm. They want to know about job creation. They want to know about small business opportunities. And you, know, you may have even done something in your um, in your contracting uh, with the, the general contractor and those vendors and subs that will be coming on that says you want a 30% uh, local employee piece, you want a 40% MWBE, men, women, disadvantaged businesses, I mean uh, uh, minority women disadvantaged businesses. Um, you know, the, all of these things enhance impact. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not saying you need to make a whole bunch of changes from anything you've already done, but just be aware that these are the kinds of ways you can make your project more impactful and you can put a little teeth in there because folks aren't gonna sign that commitment and not make a really good faith effort to do it. Um, and you have a lot of contractors that have bought into the whole concept of spreading economic capitalization, the democratization of capital. A lot of folks are, are just right where we are in terms of that. They want to see that happen. A lot of GCs, even the Associated General Contractors, which is their trade association, has endorsed uh, minority um, um, disadvantaged and women business enterprise uh, set-asides. So you're, in, you're in, uh, in good shape. Denise, did you have anything you'd like to add to our colleagues? Well, thank you Earl, for the opportunity. I don't really have anything. I'm like uh, Carlton, uh, nothing specifically to add except to encourage you. Um, I think it's an opportunity as we've been uh, visiting. I think I talked with uh, Scott this morning over breakfast. And it's an opportunity not only to um, make this presentation, but hopefully you're making relationships with each other that you will be able to draw on this forever. And I think especially for the local Birmingham folks, uh, I hope that Ted, not for the president, but for his daddy. Uh, <laughs> we talked this morning uh, again about the fact that 16th Street and St. Paul is side by side but are there opportunities for them to start to collaborate and that we hope that if anything came out of this that you are making relationships that um, you will be able to benefit not only your particular organization but it'll help benefit the city. So let me just encourage you and, I, and I'm like Grant, have fun and, and uh, we're just uh, so pleased that we had the opportunity to get to meet you and to work with you this week. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Good evening. Hey, for all of those that are out in the reception area, we're getting started. Feel free to come down and fill these seats down here. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Brent Legs. I'm a senior field officer with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and I want to welcome you all to the Birmingham Preservation Leadership Training. I first want to start out by thanking a few folks. I want to recognize Dr. Richard Walker, who has been gracious uh, providing us access to the Gaston office building and allowing the PLT attendants to help you reimagine the reuse of that nationally significant building. So thank you so much. I also want to thank our preservation leadership trainers, which includes Carlton Brown, Irv Henderson, and Jack Pyburn. Looks like you're getting a standing ovation. <laughs> 
So as I told the PLT participants this week when we first started out, the National Trust brought its dream team to Birmingham. These trainers are some of the most skilled and seasoned preservation architects and real estate developers that deal with some of the most complicated preservation projects in the United States. And it's wonderful to have you all supporting Mayor Bell and his vision for the preservation of the Civil Rights District and the National Monument. I want to make sure to thank our sponsors tonight. So all of this is supported financially by the National Park Service, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, and the City of Birmingham. Yes. I want to give a special shout out to our host, the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, and all of the staff that have supported this convening, including Andrea Taylor, Priscilla Cooper, <laughs> and our dear friend Wayne in the back. <laughs> I also want to thank my colleagues at the National Trust. Uh, specifically, I want to give a, a shout out to Rhonda Sincavage. Rhonda? So Rhonda leads all of our uh, technical pr trainings at the National Trust and has put in a lot of work to, to pull this off, so thank you. And then also my colleague, Denise Gilmore. I want to thank all of the residents in Birmingham that came out and supported us through the community stakeholder engagement. I see Brian and a couple of other folks that uh, shared their time with us on Wednesday morning, so thank you so much. And for those lucky enough to have tasted those greens, <laughs> on Tuesday, by our caterers, uh, Ambrosia. So thank you so much. And then last, I just want to say that the National Trust, we've been working in Birmingham for the last two years to support Mayor Bell and this community in creating the Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument. And we've done that through our signature program, which is called National Treasures. As many of you all know, we designated the A.G. Gaston Motel a National Treasure in 2015. So the whole intent behind this training was to learn from the preservation and business planning process. And that's what the students did this week. They have been immersed in all things preservation planning, business planning, community engagement, and how do you take a building that is nationally significant and do right by it, and go through a thoughtful and careful preservation planning process to ensure that that building retains its architectural integrity, that the community provides input and has buy-in, and most importantly, that it's economically sustainable. So before we open up uh, the presentation tonight, I want to give you all some ground rules. Anybody have a cell phone? Please turn it off. <laughs> and uh, just to remind the, the participants, please speak into the microphone since we're filming this. And I cannot wait for you to hear their ideas for the Gaston office building. They put in a lot of hard work. I know you all are ready for a vacation. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. All right. We are team two. Um, Tracy Jones, Martha Boyer, Anna, Brandon, Kelly, and Melissa. Um, so A.J. Gaston said, money is no good unless it contributes something to the community, unless it, unless it builds a bridge to a better life. Any man can make money, but it takes a special kind of man to use it responsibly. We have developed a proposal that outlines an economically viable use for the A.G. Gaston office building. Our recommendations propose innovative ideas that will allow the historically significant mid-century building to retain its character and contribute to the vi vitality of the Civil Rights Historic District. We envision a multifunctional space 
that reflects the noteworthy contributions of Mr. Gaxton and the impact that he has had all over the world. Following in his footsteps of entrepreneurship, we are encouraging the next, in, the next generation to become economically empowered. Our redevelopment of this project will result in three components. Preservation, revitalization, and sustainability that will successfully impact the city of Birmingham and all who visit. Our concept will serve as the model for all other communities all over the world. Let me get started. The proposed use. <laughs> this is our vision, and also this is an image of the building. Um, Martha will show you how we envision the program. Good evening, everyone. We hope that at this moment we actually show you some things you've thought about, wondered about, but we're going to help you see how it can become a reality as we look at what can happen with the A.G. Gaston building. As we thought about the building, so many ideas flooded our minds, so many possibilities in Birmingham that would do exactly what Tracy said. But after going through all of the possibilities, we narrowed it down to these three choices. Number one, we want to open up a cafe and event space supported by a commercial kitchen. There are so many needs in the general area. Food is not available on a regular basis in this area. So how can we make that happen? As the hospitality industry continues to grow, even with things like food trucks, how can we use that to provide service in the community? So as we look at this and this idea of a commercial training kitchen, preparing young people for the culinary industry, we think that that's a real great deal. And a very important thing that we found missing in the area, and even those of us who live here, and especially our visitors, is an information center. In this general area, it does not exist. So a part of our plan is to use part of the building as an information center to welcome guests and to also orient them to the district. We want to go beyond that. Our plans are really and truly the idea of taking the vision of Dr. Gaston and presenting it to a new generation and this idea of an entrepreneurial training center. Can you imagine what that would do for young people in our community, especially young professionals? The idea of space, the idea of also having shared staff is an opportunity in our reconfigured space. So we want to do that and also provide co-working space. As you look at our images here, you'll see that our commercial kitchen is definitely state of the art and will provide support for anyone learning, wanting to learn that industry and those who are currently involved. We also want to look at this idea of providing greater community resources. Our visitors from out of state while here found trouble at night trying to find a bank. So we would like to go back and put a bank in that building, also one that has ATM services available after hours. We will find, in just a moment, our idea for office space, thinking about what's there, how do we best put it to use to make it available for all. Okay. Thank you, Martha. I'm Kelly. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about um, our floor plans. If you'll look at the first floor, this is where most of the action is happening. You'll see we've got several spots for retail. Um, Right here, this is kind of our, our pride and joy. This is what has basically anchored our plans all week long, is this huge commercial kitchen right here um, for multi-use, multi-availability um, to offer for the community. And then to, it would actually feed into the cafe to give some short grab and go, quick, easy aspects for um, people in the community and visitors to the Civil Rights Institute. Um, the visitor center was also something that continually got brought up. We gave them a lot of space for to grow, to start out with, um, to have something to send the tourists the tourists when they first get into town. The two pop-up retail spots up front are kind of uh, negotiable to kind of see what's available, especially if they're coming in through the, uh, the kitchen and they want to sell, hey, I just made some brownies, come check it out. So we're going to try to have that option available for the pop-up retail. Um, the police satellite, that was something that was brought up in our community needs discussion of having a little bit more of a police presence, uh, especially downtown. And so this was an aspect of being able to offer that so they can training 
and we want to present our idea to you of what we have in use for the AG Gaston office building. Hey, Dr. Walker. <laughs> okay. This is a lovely picture of Dr. AG Gaston and his wife, Minnie. This is the beginning front uh, office view of the office space. Our situation analysis. Our activity tonight is to discuss the restoration and preservation of one of Dr. And Dr. A. G. and Mrs. Minnie Gasson's many acquired properties, the A. G. Gasson office building, located at the southwest corner of 16th Street and 5th Avenue North, downtown Birmingham. This building housed the Booker T. Washington Business College, the original Citizens Bank for Savings, the insurance offices, and the renowned Wynn Radio, FM, and WAGG radio stations, Citizens Drug Store, and office space for all of their employees. The Gastons saw voids and field needs through their entrepreneurial spirit by offering the black community an opportunity to get a quality business education provided job opportunities and teaching principles of saving for the future and caring for the underprivileged youth. This proposal outlines economically viable uses for the AG Gas and Office Building. The proposed new uses will allow the building to retain its character defining features contributed to and contributing to the vitality of the civil rights history, civil rights historic district. We will discuss four topics. Number one, the proposed use, a situation analysis, the building condition and recommendations, and finances and economic vitality. And at this point, I'll turn it over to my uh, colleague, Mr. Joseph Lee. Thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna change the order just a little bit. Uh, I'm going to actually talk about number three building conditions and recommendations. Uh, this is a really great building, we think. The, uh, the building uh, has some unique characteristics and some great features that we think should be preserved. Uh, the key fe features we think should be preserved and we should focus on is the blue ribbon uh, facing that goes around the vertical um, it goes around the horizontal aspects of the building and sort of reduces the, the vertical aspects of the building. It, it, it tends to add to the white columns coming down uh, and the bays uh, that penetrate uh, each uh, section of the building, both on 16th Street and uh, 5th Avenue. We also think that it's important that we capture and continue to uh, capture the original entrance to the building uh, in terms of our Fifth Avenue here. And we think uh, we're encouraging the owner to consider going back to uh, uh, opening up these uh, bays here and keeping the clear story uh, type of window penetration on the first floor in particular to bring in more light. No curtains, bring in more light, make it a very open and flowing type built, uh, built business on the first floor. So we think this is a very key characteristic of the building that should be preserved. We know that there was a sign above, before, uh, the, above the building before. We probably would encourage replacing that sign either on this location or the front location as the building is, is, uh, uh, is re, uh, re, re, rehabilitated. Uh, I want to just point out these uh, gray panels here. Uh, on the second and third floor of the building. Uh, we, we think that's a nice treatment. We want to keep this, uh, maintain these uh, window openings uh, as, they are, as they're shown there. The only defect that we saw in the building from the exterior structure was on the, uh, the west side of the building that does not face the street. This is a very, very attractive building and uh, we think we should uh, capitalize on the attractiveness of the building. Uh, the other aspect of the building we definitely think uh, the owner should capitalize on is the LR uh, Hall Auditorium. Absolutely gorgeous structure, 
the the signage above the building, uh, this uh, artist, artistic piece above the building uh, should be uh, uh, captured uh, and, and maintained. We may want to you may want to trim and remove some of the trees to so we can get a better uh, picture of that that particular frame as we uh, as we go through the renovation process. Uh, and the uh, Next, we're going to talk about the proposed uses. But before we go to the proposed uses, I want to go back here for one second. We think that the owner should look at capitalizing on the relationship between this particular facility and the Civil Rights Institute. Uh, the, uh, we think uh, 16th Street, I'm so sorry. We think 16th Street should definitely be a primary space for this particular building in terms of the entrances into these spaces here. Uh, when, you, when we look at the proposed uses, what you're going to hear is that the bottom floor, we want to open it up to the civil rights visitors coming to the Civil Rights Institute. We want it to be a place where the uh, people will actually come in uh, from uh, activities at the Civil Rights Institute into this particular facility. And my colleague will explain proposed uses. Hi, my name is Maisa, and this is AC, and we're going to talk about some of the proposed uses. First of all, what we'd like to do is return the building to the original floor plan. The word, the, the idea that kept coming to us was the spirit of entrepreneurism. That had a lot to do with the fact that we had Audrey Horn in our group, and she actually worked, worked with the great man and wife themselves. So as we worked, she told us all kinds of stories, and what came to mind is saving this spirit of entrepreneurism. So we have all commercial uses in our building, and the first thing that we would like to do on the first floor is help to to meet some of the needs for dining in this area. We know that this institute, and, and we also know that we have other tourists coming to the area just to look at the park. We saw people while we were here just taking pictures, and then they had nowhere to go. So what we'd like to do is have a full service restaurant and bar, and there's the square footage there and also an easy takeout cafe, which has cash and carry. And that would accommodate the bus groups that come in here and don't have food and they're in a hurry and you have children, you need a lower price point for them. Um, finally, we have three non-food retail spaces in the building. And our idea there is to create foot traffic and do it as quickly as possible in the spirit of entrepreneurism. We also want to generate some income as quickly as possible for the owner. So, <laughs> all right, so we have one larger space and the deficit market, the deficit analysis can figure out what might want to go into that um, larger space. But we also have two spaces that we'd like to use to cater to the demographic group between 25 and 35, the college educated African Americans who really have an interest in this story, but they don't have a place to experience it. So the first thing that we're proposing is collaborative co-working spaces. And what we find is that Birmingham indeed already has them and that they already and that they bring in income. So a daily membership here goes for about $20 a day. And the prices for monthly membership. Um, range from $50 to $850 a month. So it's already popular, it's just not here. The other thing that we were proposing as well is pop-up retail. So pop-up retail, we're not talking about the, um, the old kind of idea of, you know, here, here today, gone tomorrow, but it would complement what's going on culturally in this area. We thought that the pop-up retail space could focus on the culture 
of um, Birmingham, Alabama. It would give artisans and also um, online entrepreneurs a place to show their wares. And there's also a national trend um, toward larger um, toward larger companies um, for for uh, pop-up retail. So, for example, Kanye West and Nike, in order to get closer to the audiences they want to serve, they um, have products preview and sell for short periods of time in pop-up retail spaces. So, pop-up retail, less than a year, could be as short as a weekend, it could be a few months, and people pay cash up front. The last use on the first floor we're talking about is the auditorium, and again, complementing this district. So for the auditorium, we also believe that the building should have a commercial kitchen, which could also be a catering kitchen from the, for the auditorium. We would, have, um, we would feature local culture um, and maybe have um, temporary exhibits that complement the museum so that people come to the area, they have another destination, they continue to stay. We, we were thinking of gospel brunches, and we heard some people say that Mr. Gaston might listen in if we had gospel brunches. And now, my colleague will talk more. How's everyone doing? I must apologize, we've had some difficulties, so I have no visuals for you. You're gonna have to look in your mind and listen to what I'm saying. Get a good, <laughs> get a good sense. Second floor is the second floor is pretty much professional and legal suites. We have looked around the area and we're noticing that there are a lot of law offices just, just busting out the seams. So we're looking at pulling in law offices into the second floor as well as accounting and other professional services. We've got market rate uh, for the uh, lease space. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, that's okay, that's okay. So that's pretty much what it is. We've got uh, just spaces we want to pull the uh, like I said, those professionals in. We're also, after I talk about the third floor, uh, we're gonna, uh, we're, we're going to uh, end up falling, falling into or falling down to the second floor. The third floor, <laughs> we are going to, we're calling this the future is bright because we have uh, several offices. First, we're starting off with large offices and we hope to pull in uh, some educational institutions as uh, tennis, but also as technical advisors. We're looking at what we're calling this college row, and it's gonna be along the whole side of the building uh, where we're looking at getting uh, UAB's Institute for Human Rights, uh, looking at Auburn University's uh, Rural Studio. We're looking at Miles College's Business School. We want to try to get them to open uh, just uh, small offices there, just to be in the area and to, and to provide services to our uh, community and also maybe to our, our businesses, which I'll talk about in a minute. We're looking at future vocational training. That seems to be the, uh, the norm and what's going on now. So at that time, we'll call in Jefferson State Community College and Lawson State Community College. Go ahead and, and explain Oh, this that. is where we, I'm sorry, I had the technical difficulties. <laughs> and that's why I'm, I'm reading from this sheet. Uh, I didn't memorize all this. But uh, a key proponent of this is what we're calling a uh, business uh, incubator, where we're looking at having seven spaces, reduced rate, and we're going to have a uh, business incubator staff on site that will work with these companies say for a two-year time period. At that time, we're gonna provide technical assistance or the, the, the management company will provide technical assistance uh, with their help in getting financing. And we're hoping at the end of the two-year time period, these companies can, as I spoke earlier, move downstairs into some of the uh, spaces downstairs. If not, we're gonna focus on trying to get them to stay in the area, stay in our civil rights district. Also with that, they're gonna have, have some shared, uh, not just spaces, but uh, equipment, et cetera. They're gonna share a conference room. They're going to share copy work, excuse me, copying workroom. 
They're gonna have their own lounge. There's a library resource room. There's a file room. And there's a, a special room that used to be the former Gaston office, and we're calling this the A.G. Gaston a Heritage Room, where they can go and have serious, deep conversations and discussions about business matters. And while they're in that room, which is the corner room towards the front, they'll be able to really get a feel of what, what, what power was like and what it was like to be in an office that really uh, was in a powerful position. We're looking at also having a, uh, a commitment from the uh, uh, Birmingham Civil Rights Institute to lease two large conference rooms so they can have lectures. They have a need uh, for conference rooms and we're looking at that need and we want to fulfill that need. So they can just walk right across the street uh, when they have a, a uh, situation where they may have people coming in, whatever, a specific conference. So we're gonna be able to accommodate them. Uh, we're also going to have finally one large office with what would be 20, 20 cubicles for those small business people who may just work off their computer, but they want to come in somewhere and be in, a business, be in the business environment, so we're going to have that uh, ready for them. Let me. From there, I just want to say that uh, we're glad you all are here. We can't do this without you, and because of people like you, we think it's very important to take note of the business related organizations and, and individuals and create what we're calling the AG Gaston Business Incubator Advisory Council. This will be made up of, say, uh, educational institutions, local government entities, neighborhood business associations, everyone in the area who's concerned about business, who wants to help businesses succeed, and who may even have some expertise in helping the businesses. We're gonna do this and uh, we know we can make it if we have the assistance of these individuals. And their main role would be to help promote, not just our building, but the area, to assist uh, businesses that may need some assistance and to help, very important, raise funds to help the, uh, the business uh, building uh, succeed. And finally, in my remarks, I would like to just say that uh, this area has been empty for a long time, and most of you know that. And due to the years of uh, financial neglect and other business development and employment opportunities in this area, so we propose, you know, what we're telling you in the following. One is an increase in the retail office and other types of business development opportunities in the area. We want to provide specialized training and education for the small businesses being created in this area. And last but not least, we want to provide a new business spirit for both current and future uh, entrepreneurs and customers alike. Thank you. So to wrap this up quickly, so we do have a few expenses. <laughs> um, the project total comes to twelve million seven fifty nine and four twenty seven. Um, we know that we have certain uh, changes to make. When we talk about going back to the original floor plan, we'll be opening up the, the doors that are now windows on one side of the building. We know that we need also the, um, the commercial kitchen, the ventilation, the fireproofing. We need high-speed internet and to, to assist with the technology. And we also need um, uh, restrooms, a lot more restrooms than we have right now. They should be gender neutral and a ramp um, going into the um, auditorium. So the annual net operating income comes to $451,440. This whole project creates household and business income of $6,379,713. And the state gross product comes to $8,293,627. We expect long-term economic vi um, viability also in the form of 104 permanent jobs and 778 construction jobs through this um, project. So think spirit of entrepreneurism. Thank you.
All right, let's hear it again for the last team that presented. <laughs> Next, we will hear from team number three. Uh, because we have just been working so hard, we are just uh, very important, and we want to present to you uh, our team members, starting with Scott. I'm Scott Clark. Um, yeah, I'm Scott Clark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Duffy Westheimer. Georgette Norman. Melissa Smiley. Thank you so much, team. And we'll come back just in a few minutes to uh, make presentations to you, but we're going to start off by just saying what a delight it has been this week just to be involved in the study and the understanding of the A.G. Gaston business building and the whole history surrounding that. We have been most impressed with uh, Dr. Gaston and all that he gave to this community. He is an iconic figure, probably the largest iconic figure here in Birmingham, Alabama. With him being that iconic figure, we are disappointed that this represents what's left at this point in our lifetime. So we want to change that. We want to do something new, different, and modern. A.G. Gasson said, find a need and fill it. Successful businesses are, are founded on the needs of the people. Team three really wants to work with E laws, and I say E laws because they probably haven't come to Birmingham yet, but they on the East Coast, in Washington, in New York, they are booming. We think now is the time to bring them to Birmingham, Alabama, ELOFS. ELOFS at the Birmingham Civil Rights District at 1527 Fifth Avenue North, a three-story building, 40,000 square feet. We want to use not only as living experiences, but also retail experiences with sizes of units ranging from studios to two bedroom units. We are imagining people walking the district again, shopping, eating, riding bikes, extending the building out on the sidewalk, and enjoying the landscape and the civil rights district. We see beautiful interiors, and we're going to call on our friend to uh, continue with the presentation as we go through these beautiful experiences of the ELOFs and our businesses. So my colleague, Melissa, is handing out paper copies. This is a historic building after all. What would be appropriate for mid-century would be mimeograph, but that's not available anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so we went for Xerox copies, and you're welcome to take those with you. So I, I can't see that, forgive me. Um, but what I wanted to point out is, uh, We'll start at the top. The mechanical so systems these days don't take up as much space as they used to. And because the building's going to be used a little differently, uh, we're going to move the mechanical to each of the different units so they can control their own spaces. <coughs> Excuse me. And use that space, as Dr. Gaston did, for uh, living space. So we're going to divide that into two rental apartments or however uh, the owner would like to use them. Then on the second floor, we noticed that the original layout with the classrooms for the business college actually are a great size for apartments. So uh, those are the, the E lofts are in those rooms. On the, I think, it, um, forgive me, on the third floor, yes, we'll be able to have windows across the, the back of the building over the auditorium. Uh, otherwise, we're, they'll have the original windows. On the second floor, the same, but uh, oh, on the third floor, excuse me, because I, I don't have it in front of me, um, is Dr. Gaston's office and conference room. We're going to combine that and make it into the Gaston Executive Suite, which I'll come back to in a minute. It's a beautiful oak-paneled corner room 
with a big window that looks out onto the park, the Kelly Ingram Park, which is really very special. And then on the first floor, we're going to make that the mixed use, which is what often happens. On the side where the bank used to be is going to be what we would envision, a, uh, a greengrocer that can do cafe kind of food and use the bank window to hand it out the window or hand groceries out the window and put that back into service so that people who are walking through, biking through, can use that and do not have to come into the, into the building. We're going to open up all the original doors along the exterior and put those back in service and use some small retail spaces since people aren't keeping a lot of inventory anymore. They don't need it quite as much space. And then on the interior, you'll see a, a something that wraps around the elevator and stairs. So we're leaving the elevator and stairs where they were. And that's going to be a shared space that's going to be a little different than, for example, the Innovation Depot, which has been very successful. but. You know, there may be other ones in the future, but as an example, when people are finished there, you know, they're there for a while, but now they need something different. They want to be around different people. They want to be in a different space. They want just something different. They can come to this space. It's a little more commitment than the Innovation Depot and the like. And in there are um, flexible space. There'll be a big smart screen. There'll be a white board that's really long for people to be creative on. Um, because it's an interior space, we also um, will have clear story windows around uh, the walls from the retail space. So that brings in light, still allows privacy for the people in the retail space, but brings in light to the interior, also glass doors from the retail into that area. Um, and then a few small rooms so you can have a little privacy. If you need to make a phone call or work on a proposal with nobody around, you can focus. Then another thing to, to come back to the Gaston Suite, Executive Suite, is if you want to um, have a, a, a colleague come or some a potential partner and you want to have a nice room to work in, you can go up to the wood paneled suite and spend time up there and impress them. Um, you can be inspired, seriously, be inspired by Dr. Gaston, who did a lot of important work out of that room and just pick up on the vibe that he left behind. Uh, there's also a shared restroom on the first floor for all the first floor people. Um, oh, and the, the clear story windows will have the same kind of aluminum frame glass as the exterior, so we'll be carrying that forward and using mid-century linoleum on the floors. I think there's, um, let's see. So I, in, in reference to this, I just wanted to close my little section by saying that what we tried to carry forward is the integrity of how the Gastons used the building their interest in education and business and helping people move forward. And that's what we tried to carry into our design. So, thank you. Thank you, Duffy, for that very descriptive analysis of how we came to our design proposal. Now, we're going to discuss the situational analysis. Why restore or renovate the A.G. Gaston office? So we had to consider things like, who are the stakeholders? Who would be interested in a re restoration of this property? What would the opposition be? Would there be any community support for it? Um, what kind of factors and needs are there in this area that would support a restoration? So in considering things like, who are the stakeholders, we recognize that there are three general categories which you see defined on the screen. So we broke those down further and we came up with a comprehensive list of who would be the community, the stakeholders for this project. And we found that the National Park Service may be a stakeholder considering that there's ownership of property right across the street. The Civil Rights Institute would be another stakeholder potential residents. We've talked already about creating residential space in the building. We think those potential residents would be stakeholders. Civil rights foot soldiers, people like Miss Paulette in the back, would be a, a, would be a stakeholder in what happens with this space. And so we tried to be true to what these various stakeholders would want to see happen in this space. And so you'll find that our plans support I the ideals of Dr. Gaston. 
Okay, so what would be some of the opposition that you might find to this building? From what we could tell, historically, this space has been used for commercial office space, a business college, a bank, things like that. We're proposing something that's different, residential space. And a lot of times, people don't like change. So we're asking you to think about this building in a different way. Another, another um, thing we considered is, there's so many other lofts. Why another one? Why another one? Well, we think that this particular building offers something a little bit different. First of all, it's right across from Kelly Ingram Park. That's a disadvantage that a lot of the other loft developments have. Many of them on the north side of downtown Birmingham can't say that they're adjacent to a park. And who wouldn't want to relinquish their lawn care duties <laughs> to the public works department of the city of Birmingham? <laughs> So for those people looking for a cultural experience on a daily basis, and those who may have thought that the loft community or the loft developments were not affordable to them or didn't fit their uh, demographic status, we think this, this building offers a different type of opportunity. So a lot of our focus is on the family, professional families with adults who work downtown who want the opportunity to be able to walk to work and then have space for their children to enjoy cultural amenities like the Civil Rights Institute. We, um, this week, we had a chance to experience the Legacy Youth Leadership Program, and we thought that was awesome. And we want more of that. How can we get that by perhaps living across the street from the Civil Rights Institute? <laughs> so those are many of the factors we consider, and we thought that our plan was a little bit different. It, it brought in things that hadn't already been considered. Some of the other uses that we said on the ground floor would be grocery. The, many people have mentioned that there's a dining void. People come for the experience, and then after it's over at the museum, or even if the, once the monument is redeveloped, they're like, we like to eat. Where can we go to eat? Well, if there's a, gross, a, a green grocer on the lower level with a drive-through window where you can get a cool beverage to finish off your tour of Kelly Ingram Park, doesn't that enhance your experience? We think it does, and we hope you agree with us. So, just to make sure I don't leave off anything that I wanted to tell you about. Um, we think that our, our plans would also enhance the surrounding community in many ways. Let me tell you about those. If you bring residents to this area, it becomes a neighborhood. You've got several churches in close proximity. We think that bringing those residents back to this community could enhance membership at places like 16th Street Baptist Church. We think that would be great. Um, it would support the membership, could potentially provide increased membership. And we also think that it'll add and lure more traffic to this district. People on foot walking around through the district outside of those normal touristy hours. You see, you always see a group of people at the institute or at the church in the middle of the day, but how about some nighttime foot traffic? How about some early morning joggers around the park, you know, observing what public works has done with that, with those, with that. <laughs> So we're looking for vibrancy here, and we also want to honor what Gaston did. He was an entrepreneur by, by, he was an entrepreneur by default, but he also supported many people in doing what he did. He wasn't selfish, and so we're trying to share this building in a way that reaches back to the youth. We think Project C and that whole movement was all about the youth, and so why not encourage a family focus on the reuse of the building? So right now, I'd like to turn the mic over to Scott Clark. So this is a preservation conference, right? So one of the things we want to do, who are all these tall people around here? So one of the things we want to do is talk about the building character, the condition, and the recommendations for treatment. First thing is the character of defining features. Betty? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, by far the best character defining feature is the building, is the exterior of the building itself. It's uh, built in a modern uh, international design utilizing the reinforced concrete uh, with the aluminum frame glass and clear 
uh, glass backed with a blue acrylic on the upper floors. And that backing on the acrylic is gonna be important as we talk about condition and treatment as well. Um, the LR Hall Auditorium, designed into a commercial building, which is really kind of an unusual factor to see, uh, even at that time, to have this auditorium built in. It's kind of an emphasis as to the sense of community that uh, Dr. Gaston wanted to invoke. Um, it also has this wonderful uh, topping of a stuccoed screen and layer with this glazed tire, tile design, still with all of its integrity, just waiting to be restored. The, the segmented retail storefronts that are recessed under the curtain wall, those segmented storefronts are, will allow us to be able to open those back up again and see uh, the retail space that it was originally designed for. Uh, the former bank drive through window that we've talked about already with the metal awning on the south side of the building and the A.G. Gaston building in bold gold uh, letters uh, across the, the transom entrance. It's really incredible and really inspiring. And I can't imagine as our students come in, uh, I'm sorry, as our workers come in, the entrepreneurs come in to be able to see that inspiration as they enter the building. Um, the, also, there's the Gaston executive suite on the third floor. Uh, not only displays the plan of being at the top of his world, top of his organization, but also uh, it's beautiful with oak paneling and the access door design and frames and the distinctive rippled acrylic ceiling uh, that diffused light uh, throughout the entire room. And that, that feature is still there. Uh, the penthouse arrangement at the top floor where A.G. Gaston would go to reflect on new business ideas. Uh, the display of the original tile arrangement and steam equipment in the steam room and bath that are in the penthouse. Again, probably a key point of reflection. Um, the formed and, I'm not allowed to say twisted, uh, sculptured railing, aluminum stair rail that extends from the original lobby position to the top floor. And then of course the lobby position itself uh, in the center of the building, emphasizing the, the overall modern international design. Um, so here's our, uh, our notable preservation and rehabilitation issues. Uh, one is the failing grass acrylic panels on the south side of the building, which I'll address in just a moment. Uh, the reopening of the retail access spaces on the north and west elevations. Uh, the LR Hall Auditorium rehabilitation that will respect the, the original intent of the space, but make it viable for 21st century entertainments and meetings. Uh, also allowing light to access to the living and, and workspaces. And that's, that's those, uh, those uh, glass, yeah, right, the glass transoms that, uh, that Duffy outlined for us. Um, the relocation of, got one more. Relocation of the central building systems to accommodate the individual units for heating and cooling, uh, which will also allow us to reclaim some space for use up in the penthouse area, as well as the restoration of the Gaston office suite for rentable space and the penthouse steam room. So um, the proposed treatment, and this is where it gets kind of interesting, is the, uh, the failing glass panels on the, um, on the south side, this is not working. I guess you have to, no, won't work on that kind of screen. Okay, so uh, on the south elevation will be replaced with an electric chromatic glass that allows natural light into the living areas on the second and third floors. Uh, this secondary location be can be switched on to provide an opaque window with tinted gas that matches the hue of the exterior panels. Such an electrochromatic glass will reflect heat and provide the same R value uh, as installation as the installation currently does in a completely reversible modification to the building. Uh, the reopening of the retail spaces utilizing the original openings and pathways, doors to be replicated to match original uh, design uh, using compatible materials. Retail spaces to be built out with a clear story at the rear end rear of the space to provide light access to the shared business workspace area central building systems to be eliminated, uh, Unico and split systems to be used for many of the areas to allow greater flexibility 
and less intrusion into the historic areas of the building. Restoration of the AG Gaston business suite would be done utilizing the Secretary of Interior standards. Somebody had to say it tonight. <laughs> so that we would restore to the, the building using documentary evidence, again, another buzzword that I was said do not use. But the idea is uh, we have a rich uh, trove of material so that we can restore this, this office uh, back to the look that it had uh, when uh, the great man was there himself. Uh, and this will, allow, will be an inspirational space uh, for people working in the area. It also provides a rentable space uh, for entertainments, for corporate meetings, uh, for folks, and a nice income stream, Dr. Walker, uh, a nice uh, income stream, uh, as well as the auditorium as rentable space. So when we went through um, our expenses, uh, as they say, you pay the piper. Um, so when we went through our expenses, uh, we came up with basically, uh, when we figured our square footage, we based it on retail. Uh, the amount of retail we had. We also based it on, uh, this is a quality building, although the lofts are, don't have as much build out as some uh, retail, uh, some residential space might. Uh, but we also put into account the idea of those rentable spaces, those, those two penthouse uh, spaces, the A.G. Gaston uh, office suite, and also the auditorium, uh, renting to either theater or entertainment companies on a regular basis. And so that gave us a, a, uh, a net cost of $7,482,800. And so then when we actually figured in our income on that, uh, using those rents, uh, factoring in our vacancy and our operating expenses, gives us a net income on the building uh, in this current design of $448,156. Dollars a year. Um, and so uh, we feel that this makes this a viable project. Uh, we would be adding to the community and also adding to the bottom line. Um, as far as financing is concerned, we think what's probably appropriate is given the historic nature of this is that we would suggest uh, a feasibility study that would actually help us to determine the best forms of financing. Uh, obviously, we would um, we would be looking for new market tax credits. We would also be looking for historic rehabilitation credits. Uh, we feel that uh, the, the one major uh, issue that we want to address that would, that would uh, change materials, the moves materials are already failing as, uh, as it is, so that our solution would still allow us to be able to get those rehabilitation tax credits. Um, and uh, be able to put together a creative financing package uh, that would would work with our with our goal. So uh, now I'm going to ask Georgette to come bring us home. Home stretch. Our inspiration came from Don um, David Solomon, who told us, who was really uh, Dr. Uh, Gaston's right hand man. And he told us that it was Dr. Gaston's desire that he tell them who I am. And that really stuck with us, you know, tell them who I am. We heard him, and we are actually acting on, on those words by infusing 19 plus million dollars at the location that bears his name, a building which I housed an insurance company a bank, and a business school. This is a testament to his commitment to his people, as well as to the fabric of business in Birmingham, Alabama. Dr. Gaston was a, a dreamer, but he was also a doer. Following in his footsteps, this project E loss, everything you want. <laughs> oh my God. It's a multi. <laughs> I love that. The E, everything you want, loss. <laughs> uh, it's a multi a multicultural uh, building, multi purpose building, and multicultural. 
that will reclaim, revitalize, and restore a community that is on hard times, in disarray, has falling apart, has due to neglect. We see this as an opportunity to bring it back to its former vi vibrancy by investing in people as Dr. Gaston did, returning it to housing and hopefully bringing some of those back that were displaced, as well as employment opportunities for those who are entrepreneurs, looking for jobs, as, all, and as well as established businesses. This project is therefore going to make a major impact on the economic fabric of Birmingham, creating 64 permanent jobs, 47 construction jobs, as well as putting 5,090,800 um, tax dollars in the coffers. It will also, can it, it, can you see? from this project, we will have uh, 3,916,000 3, of those dollars remaining in the state of Alabama, primarily in M Birmingham. We feel that this project allows us to follow in the steps of uh, Dr. Gaston, where we take him, who wanted you, us to tell who he was, and allow him to walk from the past into the future. Good job, team. Let's hear it for him one more time. Yeah. And as the last team comes up to prepare, I want to give a special shout out to Ted for the behind scenes work that you did. Flipping those slides like that. <laughs> right on cue. Good job, Ted. All right, next team. All right. Uh, good evening. Uh, we're, we're team four. I'm Randall Miner. Um, uh, we've got uh, basically the dream team. Uh, we've got uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, William, William Dean Anderson, uh, who's going to be up right after I give this, uh, to kind of finish my part. Uh, then uh, Ivan Holloway and C Christine Dalton, and then I'll come and uh, at the end uh, kind of recap things. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, first of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Walker, for opening up your um, building and allowing us to come here and, and, and thank you all for taking this so seriously. We worked uh, much harder than I thought we were going to work, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but it, we, we had a lot of fun, uh, ups and downs, and, and all in between, but it, it was all good. Um, really how we were looking at this, just to kind of quickly orient you on how our thought process, we you know took in all the lessons that we learned and really started at the top of the building. And you heard other people talk. I mean, a lot of the themes that you've heard are kind of transcendent, transcendent throughout the, uh, the presentations about uh, how Dr. Gaston went to that group and the views he had. And then when you go in the building today and you see just everything that you see, and that's just what you see currently. And that's not the future that's going to be there with all the work that we're all going to be doing to make that happen. And, and so that really kind of oriented us. We started at the top of the building thinking, how can you um, repurpose that, that, the top spaces? And then we also thought about just public spaces, that, that there's so much history in this building that there, there should be a way to um, make that accessible to everyone. And so that, that kind of oriented us. We identified three or four public spaces. And so basically we ended up with a, a mix of uses that, that reflects that. And we'll go through the, uh, the, uh, the, the floor plans. That's what uh, uh, Professor Dean will do next. Uh, but kind of three orienting things were a center of influence. That was something that we heard uh, Mr. Solomon talk about, that this building was a center of influence. So that really uh, really made us think uh, holistically about the, the deal. 
Uh, we also, kind of a theme we heard uh, from the stakeholders was that the motel was a first class motel. And growing up in Birmingham and, and having seen that motel, that, that blew my mind. I, I never would have thought that that was a first class motel, but that's just because, you know, I'm, a <laughs> I'm in the younger generation and, and, you know, I have a different concept of a motel than, um, than, than others. Uh, and then uh, one of the concepts we, we learned was uh, residual value. So there's a lot of residual value here, so we tried to weave all that in together. So we were very excited about the presentation. We we're so excited that we spent 30 minutes in the, in the, in the warm-up on it, uh, going over it. So we're not going to do that because everybody wants to, to be done with this. So, <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I, uh, I'll turn it over to Dean. Humility, great humility. I thank you for the accolades, but uh, I am pretty much the opposite of all of that. I just want to say that the stars are aligned. The planets are in a row. There have been many people that have suffered in this general area over the course of years. People have been battered and died, bitten by dogs, and many people have been on their knees for many years to see this improvement come along. The God we serve is a great God and he does things in big ways and he always shows his hand by magnificent works. His work started back in January of this year, probably even before that, but we saw evidence of his work in January with the exiting of our president number 44. When he signed in proclamation the law to make this a memorial, a monument, the efforts of Ms. Terry Sewell and others who took this to another level and those who were here locally to push the federal government officials uh, provided this opportunity that we are now witnessing as people actually making the history. And with that being said, I just want to introduce our, pr our presentation. We name this a center of influence inspiring the industry of helping our fellow man, which was what Dr. Gaston was. He was a man who influenced many and his industry was to help his fellow man whether it was through being able to buy a life insurance policy, whereas they could sir, uh, get their family members buried, or whether it was selling soda. Mr. Gaston, or Dr. Gaston, as he's affectionately known, was able to create a real estate empire. He had many buildings, uh, and going back to the insurance, he would sell policies to people and then use his own businesses to actually bury those people. So having that type of an insight and mindset was unique for a, a gentleman of color in a, in a situation that was tainted with a lot of hostility and oppression. We call ourselves the Preservation Specialist Innovators Incorporated because we want to innovate a new idea in an in a area that will provide a new insight, a new look for the district, for the area, so that persons coming in this area will know that, well, this is now a new day. And whatever happens in this area, not only will it affect the micro economy of this area, but the macro, as, it, as the rings go out into the Fourth Avenue district, as it goes out into the city of the um, Birmingham City as it goes to the district uh, of the jurisdiction of Alabama and then beyond that to the actual nation and the world. Our project overview is that we would look at the building, the property as a welcome center. It's uniqueness in the, in the way in which the tiles, uh, panel, glass panels are uh, colored automatically draws the eye to it. Uh, perhaps even clearing some of the foliage down from it and allowing the uh, 
artistic qualities of the building to draw the eye to it. In the building, it would have a visitor center, and it would house a small mini uh, museum that would commemorate the life and legacy of Dr. Gaston's accomplishments. There would also be a boutique motel, which basically would assist with the overflow from the uh, General A.G. Gaston Monument. And for those persons who couldn't get a, a place there, the uh, business building, or the resource business building would be that which could house those persons. Um, the speakers that come to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute always or may need places to stay overnight. Uh, when people come to the monument in general, the park, we want to captivate them. We want them to stay here just as when you go into a casino, they, <laughs> they want you to come into that, bit, into that property and stay and spend your money. And basically, if we have a place for them to stay beyond that one day's visit and provide them a quality uh, environment where they could uh, use that time and become more familiar with the history, then that would encourage them to walk the serene pathways of the park, to look at the artwork of the park, and to become immersed into not only the beauty but the tragedy of the artwork that it shows in the depiction of the dogs, the spray, uh, ca the cannons, all of that would be would come into play and allow that visitor to be um, consumed with emotion. We would also have a penthouse rooftop patio bar. This would be used by those hotel guests, which would allow them to over, overlook into the park and uh, a place of serenity where they could reflect on what they've seen and what they want to do beyond that. In the large assembly gathering area, we would pretty much leave that alone. However, because of its ability to become more than just a large space, we would install a debatable partition system to transform the whole space into smaller training chambers, but basically improve on our audio and video capabilities. We have a place uh, dedicated for vendor. We have down here a rental or a real estate space, but it's not restricted uh, to the real estate only, but any business that would want to come in, uh, food and uh, other vendors for that particular air business. The concept presupposes the ownership of the property remains the same because the diverse entrepreneurial ent enterprises operating out of the single property, it is recommended the owner contract with a reputable commercial property owner in facilitating these daily operations. The pro of that is that the owner, the day-to-day -day operations, the owner would not necessarily have to be uh, concerned with and would allow that uh, responsibility to the property manager, which would include all accounting, maintenance, vendor property matters, and et cetera. One of the other areas that the property needs to be concerned with, even though it is now in a historic preservation monument district, it itself is not a national landmark and should be applied for national landmark status in order for it to be uh, qualified and in order for it to be recognized as a building of significance and has a purpose over the historic uh, nature of the events of the times and of this area. The con part of that is the owner does not have its day-to-day -day nuances of the operations, and uh, but he would have whatever, however that contract would be developed, uh, first-hand understanding of how his property is being managed and make the necessary changes accordingly. Here we have color-coded uh, the existing floor space and what we were thinking about doing, in addition to this area here being the overall, oops, sorry about that, the overall um, welcoming center on this corner of 16th, excuse me, 5th and 16th, the area would also have outdoor tables and chairs <laughs> that would uh, 
allow people to come to that area and from being in that area or seeing people sitting on the outside, their, their eyes would again be attracted to that space. Here we would, uh, this would be one of the main entrances, not the main entrance. <laughs> and that entrance would then bring people into where the hotel space is, as well as we were thinking about opening, opening this up and allowing more space so that when you come in there, you're not channeled in there like a funnel, but it opens into a larger area of welcome. And the space, uh, we're limited by a ceiling space, but you could always open that up, open those spaces so this flows from this space on into the next space or the next area, uh, which would be where the uh, museum and other spaces are being considered. I'm sorry, let's go back. The uh, square footage is over here where the green area has about 7,800 square feet. Hotel is the gray. This is just the hotel uh, lobby with public space going leading up to where the other elevator for the hotel would be or in this area. This is the existing uh, hotel um, elevator space in this general existing lobby. And the hotel guests would then come into this area once they would flow in to the main entrance. All of this gray area is hotels, about 9,800 square feet. And the public space is the blue, where it is could be a rented uh, for as a conference room or so forth. The pink area is just a general circulation and, uh, of the core area. Um, again, the hotel 7,434, 7,434 square feet and the public space. On this floor, you also have uh, one of your roof areas and the lower roof. Uh, okay, it doesn't show the penthouse area on this. Oh, there it is, I'm sorry. This is the penthouse where presently the mechanical area is. And we would take this, uh, we would have to be concerned with this um, condition here because of the uh, restrictions with the historic preservation of it and maintaining its character, its original character. But the outer area is for the patio where the vendor could uh, set up his areas. Situation analysis will be handled by our next uh, team member. Mr. Ivan Holloway. Thank you so much, Dean. So, uh, we've heard a little bit about what we believe our concept is for this building. Just to give you some context, the value proposition that this particular opportunity creates is a diversity of business, and it builds on the legacy of Dr. A.G. Gaston, the man, and the building. They both present a uniqueness about our history, our culture, and his dedication to business. The preservation, the redevelopment of this building presents an opportunity for people to be engaged from a visitation standpoint, a functional usage, and again, the preservation of such a building. Dr. A.G. Gaston's uh, early construction partnership with the Bank Building and Equipment Corporation of America presented a new opportunity for Birmingham at the time. It's a testament to his dedication, his commitment, and his prowess in business. Dr. Gaston had an opportunity to not only create jobs, create infusion of investment, but he also created opportunities for his wife to be a part of his vision. She had an opportunity to locate her school on the second floor. So with that context, we're able to understand that Dr. Gaston was able to invest in people through his corporate investments, human rights, through his philanthropy, 
and the physical development through his revenue. So let's talk a little bit about the numbers that support our vision. So uh, we know that tourism is trending up in the state of Alabama and in Birmingham. So in Birmingham, we had over 4.4 visitors uh, in 2015, and we've had an increase of 6.1% since 2014, creating an economic impact of about $929 million of resident income. There's a growing market for heritage tourism. That's important for this district. Last year, there's an estimated number of 145,000 annual visitors just to the district. We expect an annual increase of about 200,000 visitors to the district because of the National Monument designation. These additional visitors are expected to spend somewhere in the neighborhood of about $80 million. Now, with that kind of investment, with that kind of return, uh, we can see the need for a facility as we're proposing. But I'll give you some more data. And I will tell you, Birmingham has changed over the last few years. So it's exciting to be here talking about this kind of growth and this kind of opportunity. In a five mile radius, uh, there's a $517 million demand for eating and drinking establishments. Where the supply was about three million Three, I'm sorry, three, uh, 311 million, leaving a gap of about 205 million. <coughs> In a one mile radius of what we're proposing, there's a gap of 44 million. So there's an opportunity, and opportunities are meant to be met. We expect the job to be created from this investment to be somewhere around 40, uh, 55 permanent jobs and about 41 construction jobs. We estimate about three to four vendor opportunities creating what we believe is just an enormous opportunity. So the household and business income generated by a project of this size is about $3.4 million and the gross state product is about $4.4 million. Now, we look at a number of advantages when we talk about a project of this size. Uh, we're talking about a, the need for retail space being met, uh, additional eating establishments being brought online, and opportunities for local and national entrepreneurs to become a part of the Birmingham landscape. This is truly a unique, a unique opportunity. And we believe that we can provide an opportunity to meet the needs of this opportunity. So now, that being said, we believe that this development will make the community pop and create a chain reaction of opportunities for small business growth, investment, and enticement in the community. So we're creating destination synergy around what we believe is a new opportunity. So I won't go into a lot more, but I will turn it over to Christine and she will talk a little bit about the structure. Thank you, Ivan. Ivan just um, used the words destination synergy, and I want to be clear that we looked at this project as destination tourism. So we've got some really important and special things going on here. We have a very significant building in a very significant location that is part of a series of extremely significant events. And we think that the building has a lot of value for the um, interpretive experience that it could give the visitor to the building. So when we looked at the building existing conditions, one of the things that we wanted to be really careful was to see what existing original historic fabric is still there that could be capitalized upon for the visitor experience. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the exterior characteristics. The building was constructed in the international style and it was one of the first in Birmingham in this style. It's three stories and it has a setback penthouse. The first floor is of brick veneer and aluminum storefront and the second floor is blue and white acrylic glass curtain walls and aluminum frame. 
And I just want to be um, very clear that all original exterior features are going to be restored to their original 1960 appearance. So as that building looked in 1960, it will look when it's restored. That includes reinstating the storefront entries on the first floor that will be utilized for retail. Interior characteristics that are still intact are staircase, oak paneling on the third floor in A.G. Gaston's office, tile bathroom and sauna in the penthouse, ceiling grid in A.G. Gaston's office. And all of those original interior finishes are going to be restored to their 1960 appearance as well. The auditorium consists of aluminum storefront, glass, concrete, in inlaid glazed tile, and a metal, metal canopy. All original exterior and interior features of these spaces will be restored to their 1960s appearance. So where we could do it, we definitely strive to do so. So to break it down, our areas to be restored are the vestibule and the building lobby. This is extremely important for the visitor experience because this is the space they're going to enter. And this was the main entry space when it was operating as, as A.G. Gaston's office building. The second floor conference room is especially important because this was the location of the daily meetings of the coordinating committee that met in the spring of 1963 that coordinated the marches. The executive office wing, which consists of the executive foyer, A.G. Gaston's office, secretary's office, office of the agency director, insurance office, four other minor offices, and a storage closet will all be restored to their original appearance, and as I said before, the auditorium, interior and exterior. The, the concept that we came up with for um, restoring this is, is the idea that we're going to have these spaces open to the public for viewing as museum spaces. But anybody in preservation knows that museums generally don't make money. They lose money. So we came up with the concept of the boutique hotel because it was the way that we saw to gain the most dollars for the project and basically the museum piece winds up being an almost philanthropic piece of the project, but we felt that it was essential because these are the aspects of the remaining architecture that is critical to telling the story of the time period. So we do the hotel piece to actually financially support the heritage tourism piece. Access. I want to talk a little bit about access to the building. So we're going to have public access to every restored area that I just described to you is going to be public access. The second and third floor areas that we are proposing for restoration are going to have a full-scale interpretive program that explains the spaces. They're going to have displays. They're going to have memorabilia. They're going to have artifacts from A.G. Gaston's time period. We're even hoping that somehow we can obtain some original furnishings or at least based on photographic evidence get period appropriate furnishings for the space. We are going to have this second, second floor conference room available for rental. So BCRI and other institutions said that there is a need for spaces. So we're going to provide those rental spaces at the second floor conference room and also the auditorium, which seats up to 600. So you could have some pretty serious events, which would result in some pretty serious cash for the property. And limited access is going to be the hotel rooms and the personal service establishments. Um, William showed you that on the second floor there's going to be some space where there are no windows. Those are going to be some personal service establishments upstairs that would be um, leased by outside vendors, but we're envisioning to market this as barber shops, perhaps a spa, things like that, that would serve the needs of the hotel guests, but also be accessible by the public. And limited access, um, like I said, is going to be to the hotel rooms and all of that. Where we have the limited access on the second and third floors, our treatment option of those is going to be just clear glass walls so the visitors to the public spaces can see down the hallways and they can see the rest of the spaces. So it won't be completely closed off, it will just be a clear glass panel. We've got some upgrades that we will definitely need to have happen in order for our vision to be realized. One is that the existing eleva elevator needs to be upgraded and we need to extend it to the fourth floor so it could come out onto that outdoor patio and um, bar area overlooking the street. 
we need to install a secondary elevator that's going to be for the hotel use and we found a, a um a not very utilized area that it can be tucked away in at, in our proposed hotel lobby area and we're going to have to have some security on the building so key card access those will be some um, technology upgrades and we are going to have handicap accessibility to all areas um, to make sure that anyone who comes to visit the site is able to actually get in and see what they want to. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Randall. All right. Um, I'm going to make this quick. Uh, you know, one of the things I remember, uh, you know, about Dr. Gaston growing up here is uh, how much money that he had, and you never knew quite mu how much money he had, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and so one of the things about this is we, we looked at a couple different scenarios in terms of the financial return and made some assumptions about uh, hotel rates. But one of the things that you know, I heard one of the other groups say about the feasibility study, I mean, that obviously would drive everything that we would do in terms of this. And one of the other um, kind of stakeholder comments we got was, well, if you've got, you know, who is this boutique hotel for, right? And, and one of the things that we uh, spent a lot of time thinking about was how, the, how you make this building a center of influence but not um, create a situation where you're, it's adverse to what we're trying to do in the district. And so uh, we've got a couple of different financing options, but all that will ultimately be driven by uh, the feasibility study and, and the room counts and, the, and things of that nature. But when we, when we kind of played architect, uh, sorry, Jack, you know, Played architect, we came up with minimum of uh, 30 rooms, and uh, you, you heard my, my colleague talk about some of the, the, the ideas we had about preserving those spaces and making it to where people could, from the public could come and, and, and participate in those rooms, even if they're not gonna pay the $3,000 a night you know, that we're gonna charge them to stay at the hotel. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, <coughs> but one of the things that we, we looked at was um, uh, in terms of our, our plan of finance was obviously uh, federal and state historic tax credits because uh, this whole thing is, to, is d designed to preserve it in a way that makes it eligible. So those would be obvious choices. But one of the other things that we could do based on the feasibility study, based on some of our stakeho stakeholder uh, communications is pursue new markets as well. Because if you did that, then we could have some subsidies available for some of the local community groups, some of the local stakeholders to utilize the hotel at a below market rate. Uh, we feel very confident that we could charge whatever we wanted for some of these rooms, um, just to be frank, especially for some of the, the, the conference room spaces. And if, if the DCRI does all the things that they're talking about, this could really be a $300 <coughs> a night plus place. Uh, we ran it at uh, $149 a night um, and made some assumptions about um, you know, what we thought were reasonable assumptions and the, the net operating income from that was over a million dollars a year. So it was, it was something that we think is economically viable but also helps subsidize the rest of it. So I don't, you know, I didn't present those numbers because, you know, there's a lot of assumptions that could be made but, you know, that, w that was our analysis and all of our economic impacts were based on a development cost of about $7 million and, uh, you know, that was based on the, 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 uh, the cost estimates that we got. So uh, in conclusion, it's time to drink, uh, <laughs> um, but, but, but seriously, we, we think this is a, uh, would be a, a great opportunity for something like this for at a concluding uh, ceremony for something like this, you could have it at the, at the Gaston and, and then we could all go to the rooftop and have a drink and, and toast the hard work we all done. Thank you. And I agree with Randall, it's time to drink. But before we do, <laughs> I just want to say, I, I hope, Dr. Walker, that you see the hard work that the PLT participants put into reimagining this space. And everyone here, they worked really hard on this. And I think you all did a fantastic job. We saw significant improvements from your mock presentations. <laughs> And we'll talk about that tomorrow in our last three hours before you fly back to your, your, your homes. But again, thank you for uh, coming out tonight, and, and let's finish up the refreshments. Good night.